this tiny state on the west coast of India, just 3,702 kilometers in area, holds a place of pride in avian or bird population. Goa is home to around 400 of the approximately 10,000 bird species that are seen around the world, an astonishing 4% in this birder's paradise. Fascinating stories of bird sightings and migratory birds who travel thousands of kilometers to make a stopover in Goa has been a cause for much delight amongst avid birders. Sadly, few in Goa know of this birding hotspot and the mindless destruction of their habitats, be it forests, saline mangroves, wetlands or lakes could spell doom to these winged wonders. However, efforts by individual bird lovers and promotion of bird watching tourism by the government of Goa could hold hope to sustain the avian diversity in years to come. As part of our environment series, our topic for today is birding in Goa and avian paradise. It is my pleasure to present to you Mr. Savio Fonseca. He's an avid birder since 2010 and a leading authority on birds found in Goa. Along with India's leading ornithologist Bikram Grewal, he has authored the book Photographic Guide to the Birds of Goa. Savio is doing his bit, not just in conserving bird diversity areas, but developing avian tourism. He also uses social media to create awareness and connect with people with similar interests. So welcome to the program, Savio. I'm happy to have you here. So let's get straight away to the questions of interest. So of the 400 odd birds spotted in Goa, which are the bird hotspots? Thank you, Caroline, for inviting me and your kind description. Yes, uh, Goa is indeed a very important birding uh, destination, not only for India, but for across the world. It's actually the West Europeans, the British, Germans, and Scandinavians who actually first discovered Goa as a birding hotspot in the 80s. And over that a over a period of time, things have built up, and Goa is indeed an important destination. That's nice. Now, when you say which are the hotspots in Goa, it actually can start in your own backyard. And what I've seen is people in Goa, if they, they start doing some birding, and probably it takes over, evolves over years, and at the end of five years, you probably would have spotted hundred of the four hundred species found in Goa in your own backyard. All right. So. Every square foot of Goa is an important bird, birding hotspot. Having said that, there are indeed some birding hotspots which, you know, score around 300, 250 bird species out of 400 we see in Goa. Okay. So I'm not talking about in terms of uh, ranking as such, but the important birding hotspots in Goa are Bondla, Kotigaon, Netravali Wildlife Sanctuary, Molem Wildlife Sanctuary, that includes Bhagwan Mahavir National Park then Made Wildlife Sanctuary, Sukur Plateau, Verna Plateau, then Morji, Morji Beach, Kuturi Wetlands, okay. that means including including Maina, Raya and Shiroda, in, uh, parts of Makanzana, and Karamboli uh, Lake Complex. Now why Goa is very important as far as birding is there? I think there are few places in the world where in an area of 3,700 square kilometers have eight different diverse habitats okay. and birds are a function of the habitats they found and the kind of habitats found in Goa like are beaches and estuaries then you have mangrove zones then freshwater lakes freshwater wetlands basically then grasslands and plateau uh, cultivation areas we have habitation gardens then we have also hills and forested areas and of course one of the hottest hot biodiversity hotspots of the world like compared to Congo, compared to Amazon, compared to uh, Borneo, we have the Western Ghats okay. and that is also part of Goa. Yes. So that is the reason why and in Western Ghats people are still discovering frogs, snakes, New assorted varieties. wildlife found in Goa. So I think I sufficiently put in perspective yes, I think the an, an yes. answer to your question. Yes, it has. Um, and I know uh, that you know uh, we have got such diverse uh, hotspots. I mean, and, and, and habitats. I mean, in Goa, and of course, of the 400 uh, odd birds that you have photographed and uh, have 
published in your book, um, which would you say are specifically that you can point out are beautiful and unique in terms of vividness of color perhaps just to get some interest in our viewers on discovering these beautiful birds. See, I am so deep into birding yes. that I have lost the need to find which is the most beautiful. Okay. Because we see them every day, we find something, it's like a human being. When you see first a person, you might find that person beautiful. But when you get to know, you find that beautiful traits about that person, the behavior, mm. the kindness and all that kind of a thing. But again, one of the most beautiful birds is considered to be the Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher. All Vivid right. colors. You have bright orange, bright pink. How many colors? It has a sort of seven colors. Seven colors. Then we have the Indian Pitta, hmm. which in Hindi is called Navrang, which okay. has nine colors. Wow. Okay. okay, and of course not. Uh, I don't want to rank it as such, hmm. but another outstanding bird is the Malabar trogon, which is endemic to the Western Ghats and Goa included. Wow. Okay. The Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher is also endemic to the Western Ghats and part of Goan thing. So that is actually made the cover of my book. All right. Yeah. Is one of the most. I mean, among the more vividly coloured birds. Yes. All right. Now, uh, Savi, there are amazing stories of migration of birds. Uh, over long enduring journeys. So uh, one that stands out I think is the Amur Falcon. Tell us about it and, uh, and its journey to Goa. See our understanding of science is hmm. evolving. Hmm. It's so evolving so fast due to technology these days that what we know about something a year back may be completely different what we know today. And one of the examples is the Amur Falcon. Now the Amur Falcon has a name suggests Amur is a river in Upper Mongolia, North East China, Korea, that rhyme. And this bird is found over there. But when it migrates and is found in the steppes, steppes are basically vast grasslands like mm. of Mongolia and all that. But due to the advent of winter, they need to seek warmer grounds, a better source of food, so they migrate. So what they do is they come down to Southeast Asia, that is Vietnam, uh, Indochina basically. From Mongolia. Yeah. And then they proceed to Nagaland. Now Nagaland we have a reservoir called the Dongang uh, Reservoir, where even when scientists actually observed the sky, their scientists used count to counting birds. But when they saw those birds there, they were easily able to count 2 million of them at one point of time. Okay. So you can understand the number of birds which are flying there. Now, Nagaland is, is a poor place, it's a very it's a rural area. And these birds provided a cheaper source of protein. Oh. So there was a lot of poaching there. To an extent around 15,000 birds a day being killed. Being killed. So this not only create a lot of awareness in India, but around the world, where scientists from the European Union came down and the government uh, s activated as a missionary. And government sometimes when it comes pushed to a shock, they were actually very, very active. And they made sure not a single bird was killed in 2013. Meanwhile, scientists caught three birds and put radio tra satellite taggers to those birds and it is the first time in history we were able to track the progress, the trajectory of the bird to its wintering ground. Nobody knew where they used to winter. They thought it was Africa. So the tracking of the bird showed that these birds moving to Bangladesh, moving into the Bay of Bengal, flying around 15 kilometers off the coast parallel to the eastern coast of India, making landfall at Vijaywada coming into the Indian Deccan Plateau, that is where we be there, Northern Karnataka, Gulbarga and all those places. Then coming to Dandeli, wow. coming to Goa and from Goa they fly non-stop to Somalia. Non-stop? How non -stop. many days? Around uh, 7 days. Wow. That okay. is around 5000 kilometers, non-stop. That's that amazing. Still that point of time, they, the endurance capability of any creature on earth was never known. We know that the cheetah is the fastest land yes. animal, the peregrine falcon is the fastest uh, bird on earth and so many things. But till that time we did not know the endurance capability of such a small bird. This bird is as big as a pigeon. Wow. 
In fact, boy. if you can, between 5th and 15th of November, they are usually found in Goa, like places like Verna Plateau or Sukur Plateau. They can be still, they could they, be spotted. They are seen, they are passing through. Okay. And they feed on caterpillars on the grasses which are mm. found on these plateaus. They tank themselves up for in terms of protein and make this epic journey across the sea. Wow, that's amazing. Now, again, uh, when you said 2 million birds, you have rabbits which multiply m at an exponential rate. You have rats which are a thing. So why do you have 2 million birds? Because it is journey across the sea, there could be an attrition rate. Mm. where scientists can po uh, sometimes speculate maybe there is around 35% of the birds making the crossing would end up crashing into the water. Mm. So nature has provided a redundancy where they mm. breed at a higher rate to take care of their population. Population automatically. That automatically. Would, yeah. So nature is, we are just trying to understand nature, okay. but nature has a lot of solutions for a lot of things. All right. So, so now in, uh, you've given us this amazing story of the Amur falcon. But there are many other birds that travel uh, really long distances to come and uh, settle in Goa but to escape the harsh winters. So where do they come? How do they navigate the, their way here? They don't escape the winter. Okay. Okay. That's what we normally think. It's uh, like coming to warmer climes. But they actually are in search of food. Yes. As I said, most of these migrants hmm. breed and uh, survive in the steppes. That is the, uh, what do you call, the grasslands of the north, the savanna kind of grasslands. Mm. Uh, but you call it the prairies in America, you call the steppes in Eurasia, and you call them the savanna in, su in southern Africa. There's a lot of food available in terms of grass, in terms of insects, and mm. all like. And most important, these places are very sparsely habitated by humans where the density of the population may be two persons per kilometer or even less. Oh. Okay. So, they would be happy living there in those environments. But what makes them come over here, the entire landscape there is frozen during the winter. Mm. It's covered by snow, maybe a meter of snow or a half a meter of snow. And absolutely there is no scope for food. food. So, for that reason, during winter, they migrate to oh, warmer yeah. climes like India and etc. and all that. All right. Yeah. So, where in Goa do these, uh, quite a lot of these migratory birds that you would find? In so, depending on the habitat. So, I said there are eight habitats, beaches so and estuaries, all of mangroves, freshwater wetlands, grasslands and plateau, cultivation areas, habitation and gardens, hills and forest. So, whatever fits their needs, they would be they going would to those. They would be there. Okay. Specifically, we are talking about birding in Goa and it's varied. Uh, kind of birds that we have. It was distressing to know that we had vultures quite a lot, uh, I mean some point of time and now they seem to have disappeared in Goa. Why did that happen? And uh, a secondary question is do you have or do you know of any plans to reintroduce vultures in Goa? Okay. As I said science is evolving. Mm. I probably got the data from people before me and uh, probably processed the data and felt that vultures were part of a landscape. After uh, studying a lot of new emerging data, I have a feeling vultures were never part of a landscape. Okay. Because what I've seen is the vultures are part of a landscape at the Deccan Plateau, but not of the coastal areas between the Western Ghats and the coast, especially on the west coast of India. Because I don't see vultures in uh, the Konkan area of Maharashtra, neither of Canada, South Canada, North Canada, neither in Kerala. But we had them here. We South had them here. So I studied also why they we had it. And I'll tell you the reason. In Uzgaon, we had a Goa meat complex. Yeah. And during those times, they used to dump the carcass yes. behind the factory. Okay. So the vultures used to come and sit down there and uh, feed on the carcass. Hmm. But because of change in guidelines about disposable, disposal yes. of carcass and all that, I think there have been some cases and that kind of hmm. a thing. They have stopped at practice and as a result the vultures are no longer found there. Alright, so you don't think that they need to be reintroduced here? In okay, now what is happening is I have looked at the way of whether we need to introduce vultures. Uh, one thing is, remember a flock of vultures. Hmm can reduce a full blown, full grown cow to bones in 20 minutes. Okay. 
So that is the volume of food they require. require. Niger, we have wild animals which are so big. We have the smaller wild animals, maybe a mongoose, maybe mm. a giant squirrel, uh, maybe a small deer. But we don't have tigers, we don't have elephants, we don't mm. have bi that much of bison and all. So that, so I would not consider it. I would re uh, look at it with the new information we have. All right. Mm, now looking at uh, a lot of the birds that you see in Goa's wetlands. Uh, we've noticed that they have varying lengths of their legs. Is this that nature has so designed them? Is there a purpose why different wetland birds have different length? Yeah, leg that's lengths? a very good question, Caroline. Uh, as I said, nature considers everything, takes into account mm. every aspect. Uh, very simple, a wetland mm. has water and has land. Yes. And at the margin of this water, where the land meets the water, it's a kind of a gentle slope which is formed. That is formed because of tidal action and all. Mm. And it erodes the sides, the sandbanks and all. And as a result, you, over a period of time, you have a slope. Like how you go to the beach, it's a very sloping Slopey kind of a thing. Huh. And there's a tide action which goes up and down and keeps the slope maintained. Now, there is food at every point of the slope. At a deeper point and at the shallower point. So the birds with the shorter legs would be feeding at a shallower point and mm. the birds that are longer with the longer legs would be feeding at a deeper point in this way nature ensures their distribution of food oh, so they don't compete with each other everyone is to himself has sufficient enough exactly to eat. oh yeah. that's nice that's interesting um another question about birds is we often think that you know the male is more colorful uh, than the female like for example the peacock or the blue capped rock thrush or perhaps even the greater painted snipe. And it's always said that they're more colorful in order to attract the female for mating. But you seem to have a different view. Is this correct? Again, science is evolving and mm. it comes up with new information, more plausible information. I'll give you, uh, let's get out of Goa. Uh, in the Arctic areas, you have the Arctic phalarop, also called the redneck phalarop. Mm you have the female of the species which is larger okay. uh, more endowed okay the male is smaller so what she does is she mates with around four or five males mm. the males prepare the nest and she lays the eggs in each of the males nest and then the male takes the responsibility of sitting on it hatching it hatching. and even feeding the the young ones, the young ones. And the males stay even during winter in the northern regions while the female comes down to south, hmm. leaving the males to fend for themselves. Okay. Okay. So the phalarop has a kind of a cousin here in Goa called the Hasena. It's spelled as J-A-C-A-N-A, oh, but, but it's a Spanish name, so it's Hasena. So we have the bronze wing Hasena and we have the pheasant tail Hasena. Hmm. Similar, the female is bigger, uh, it looks similar to the male, uh, mates but with around five males hmm. and those chaps have this in a five nest and they are separated by their territories. Okay. So we have that kind of a thing. Similarly, we have the greater printed snipe as you had told me. Now you may ask why are the females, general females, yeah, who tend a duller and the males more prominent? Hmm. Now there's another reason. What happens is when the female is the one who tends to the nest, she sits on the eggs and she needs to go in and out to feed herself or maybe bring feed for the babies. Hmm. Now the bird is most vulnerable when it's on the nest for predators, maybe even like crows, then your raptors, your hmm. snakes, all kinds all of, kinds. even monitor lizards and those kind of things. And how will these predators find a nest? Only by looking at the behavior of the female. Mm. So if she sees, if the predator sees a bright bird going to the nest, then we obviously, yeah. so Much then it's, it, it's where the nest is. Mm. So that's the reason she's dull. So she can inc inconspicuously go to the nest quietly while doing her errands. So that explains the duller plumage of a female. But why is the male so brightly and ordained? ordained? Yes. There is a reason. While the female does this and there is a predator around, 
the male's job is to distract the predator. Oh, so he with his colorful plumage. So he will take the predator on a different, on a kind oh. of a wild goose chase yes. and to All take right. them away from the nest. Hmm. So I have seen this with the hornbills. I have seen with the. So it's not to basically to attract the female, it is to distract the predators. It is exactly. That's interesting <laughs> because that's what we normally hear. Yeah. You know, like. But we have to understand we leave science because that's one of the reasons why we have to conserve nature. But we still don't have the understanding about life on our own yes. planet. And there's so much to learn actually. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, what is the actual work that you do to create awareness on bird species and, uh, and, and their habitats? There's a prayer which is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, but it's, I don't think it's St. Francis of Assisi. It's called, Lord, give me the courage to change things I can, patience to accept things I cannot, and the wisdom yes, to know the difference. difference. Now, obviously, I can't change anything. Hmm. So, we probably have to work on some kind of a scale, on some kind of audience, to educate the people of how sensitive we need to be towards nature. I have been to Bondla because Bondla is a zoo, but we go to Bondla to see the free animals. Mm. We, we have gone hundreds of times to Bondla. We have taken clients to Bondla. But there's unanimity in all of us that we don't want to see the zoo, we don't want to see the caged animals. Mm. So we need to get people involved, we have to make them understand, open your eyes and listen to things around and try to understand that we need to change things. Nice. So we try to do it, we find social media very strong, hmm. we find Facebook very strong. So we have made a group of Birds of Goa, we made a group called Where Wildlife Goa on, on Facebook. Facebook. And we have got 18,000 people on uh, Birds nice. of Goa hmm. who contribute photos, who give the names, who give hmm. the location, share some information about the birds and vocabulary. Now, even if I ask you how many birds you know, you might uh, name around 10. Yes. I think uh, you 30 would be a challenge. Definitely you will not be able to name 100. But those people who have been on a group, I'm sure their vocabulary has gone to 100 to 150 birds. All right. So I would say it's a small step, but good enough. It's very good enough. Yeah. So what are the kind of things when you say you do, you take people on like field trips or to create this awareness. So how do they get to know, like reach the number of 100 as you would say? Uh, like take for example, uh, I'm actually now doing uh, birding commercially. Hmm. I'm focused on uh, incoming tourists, inbound tourists coming hmm. from uh, rest of India or rest of the world hmm. who want to see the unique bird life of Goa. Okay. Now as far as the local which is concerned, I really do sometimes training for kids eight years, nine years, ten years old, I take them out and uh, these boys are very, very interested. Hmm. For, unfortunately, the school doesn't teach them anything about biology, about zoology, about ornithology. So they are blank, beyond a crow and All a right. bokeh and that kind of a thing. Hmm. And it is very fulfilling that after one week of training, these boys' vocabulary goes to 100 birds. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. So specifically, Savio, what would you uh, what would you like to see changing with regard to conservation uh, of bird habitats in Goa? Very simple. I would like more people to get involved. All right. In just understanding and having a sympathetic view of birds. Okay. And I think people should just take out from their mind about development. Okay. What is development? Hmm. Running, getting up at six morning dressing up, going to, uh, if you're staying in Walpoi, running to Panjim, working there like a dog and then coming back in the evening and having it's no... Not your idea. Is that development? Okay. Even a politician should understand what is development. Development, it means quality of life. All right. I know that you specifically, when you talk about birds, you say that one of your big messages is really not talking about bird conservation, but just be kind to birds. So practically, how would you say we would do, anyone watching a show would be able to be kind to birds? In what way? Uh, you know, I'll be, I'll digress a little. Uh, we have a Pope, Pope Francis. It's the first Pope in the history of Popes who has taken the name of Francis. And that name Francis comes from St. Francis of Assisi. Mm. 
Saint Francis of Assisi is a good orator is being respected not only by Catholics by a lot of other religious uh, religious lines whatever mm. it is but Saint Francis of Assisi is a patron saint of animals yes and if you uh, read about him it's all about being kind, kind to animals and all and i think if you're kind to animals you automatically become kind to your fellow humans All right. Okay, but there is exception. There are some people who are kind to dogs, but not kind to humans. Humans, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I've heard this, but largely that's what you believe in. Yeah, right. you have to because it starts with simple yes, things. Do you use a spray to kill mosquitoes in your room? Because a spray will kill the lizards, will kill the moths, kill the butterflies. All right. Do yes. you kill ants because they're coming for your tea? You have mm. to start small things. All right. Because if you start killing that, then where do you stop killing? Okay. And why do you stop killing? you should not kill at all all right in short be kind to all creatures great and small yeah. now last question is if anyone really is interested in birding trips in goa where can they get the information of and i would suggest that they should start birding in their own backyard first yes they should learn to appreciate what is around them because i want people to protect their own environments first before getting out the house and doing agitation and uh, saving some other things and all you start at home and okay. that is very very important they can always b- come to me bird with me our website is have a set-peregrine.com okay. but i would say if you're very serious about birding you should start at home and once your score touches around 100 birds then you're ready to see the world all right so i think we have done uh, a lot of it got a lot of information from you sabio thank you so very much for not only uh, coming on to our show telling our viewers all about the birds and the avian paradise that we have here in goa and i hope that after your your talk that people would rekindle their interest not only in birds but in also trying to uh, save their habitats that we have in goa thank you thank, thank you thank very you. much